A very happy Sabbath to all of you. Praise the Lord. Let me see all of us. It's a bit cold. Let's stretch out our hands to the Lord and say, God is good. And all the time. Amen, amen. We thank God and especially for our viewers online. We also recognize uh, your fellowship and we believe that the Lord will bless you together with us. Uh, I have to begin by thanking the Lord for allowing me to be in new life again. As I was leaving campus, I met one of my colleagues and uh, she gave me a word that was quite interesting. I told, she asked me where I'm going and told her I'm going to preach at New Life. And then she told me, okay, you go and have new life. So I hope you will indeed have new life from the word of the Lord. Let me uh, acknowledge and uh, extend my appreciation to the pastors, Pastor Sami. Thanks for uh, the invitation and uh, our, in absence, our senior pastor, Kali, for allowing me to, to come and share this pulpit. It's indeed a privilege. We do not take it for granted. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, the facilitation of my elder Guto and uh, brother Shimron for having been in contact with me to ensure that this day comes to pass. And to all of us who have allowed ourselves to be here this morning, may the good Lord bless us as we find fellowship together. Today we are on a community service Sabbath in conjunction with the deaconary, and I hope that our minds and our hearts will be drawn to the care and uh, the concern of the people around us, for that is a call of our message uh, this Sabbath. I want to pray with you and then uh, thank you, Mike, for reading out the word so well, uh, but you allow me also to find the feel of it as we read it together again. But let's pray as we read the word of God. Father in heaven, thank you so much that I'm here and thank you for your people that you've also drawn to be here today, O oh Lord. I still sick of you for what you have said, that you will not cast away anyone who comes to you. And as we have come to you this day, grant us the desires of our hearts as we delight in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Luke chapter 10, a very familiar story. In fact, among the most famous stories that Jesus told, uh, besides the story of the prodigal son, I want to believe that this is one of those very common stories that we all have had, uh, at least for the time we've been around. As I've said, Mike read it out for us so well, but let's feel it again. It's the word of God, and it doesn't matter how many times we read it. Let me read it with you. Je um, Mike was reading from the King James Version, and I want to read from the English Standard Version. This is what the word of God says. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a, Le a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on him oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. 
On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the inner keeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll pay you. So, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? In verse 37, Jesus said, uh, the man replied, he who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go, do likewise. That is the word of God, children of God, this morning. And I want to begin by remembering a colleague of mine, a pastor, who one day said a statement that seems sometimes to resonate. He said, I love the ministry. I love to do ministry. I enjoy the preaching, but not so much the people that I preach to. And in another place, a certain church member would say something that more or less related to what the pastor said. One church member said, well, I have no problem loving the whole world. I only have a problem loving my neighbor, the one who stays next door. You know, people of God, it's so obvious that at times it's easy to relate in a more abstract manner, to relate in a more general manner, just like the pastor would say, that I love to do ministry, but he says he has a problem with the people. And a member would also relate to everyone except the neighbor that stays in his vicinity. It appears that most of us all get caught up in this reality that we, 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 we love to love generally. But when it comes to love specifically, then it becomes a bit a challenge. It is very easy for people to love just for the sake of loving or for the sake of the word to love. As we are drawn today for a community service, it's easy. We feel it's good. It's, a, it's an ideal, noble, uh, noble philosophy as a people of God. Anyway, what is it about being a Christian? It's to love. Nobody denies that. But as they would say, when the rubber meets the road, where indeed you have this neighbor who is quite a nuisance, or you have this brother, or you have even a wife or a husband, or even a child who indeed is the closest to you, then loving becomes a problem. Then loving becomes difficult. Today in the parable of the, parab uh, the, parable of the Samaritan, Good Samaritan, Jesus is drawing us to certain lessons he wants us to really appreciate what it is to become a Christian. What is it for us to be human? You know, at times when people do noble things, especially like now in Kenya, when we begin to relate to some of the realities of life. I remember recently, uh, one statement was made by the president and he said that if you have to pay the finance bill, if you have to relate to the finance bill, he said that you are a Kenyan. And then he says... If you do it, then you are human. I think he said something like that. But well, it is true that sometimes when we do things that seems to, to show concern of those that are close to us, we become really what is human. Jesus, in the parable of the, of the Samaritan, the parable of the Samaritan draws our attention to the essence of loving. And in a, in a way, to the essence of serving those who are around us. Jesus calls us to be reminded that it's impossible to say that you love God and you don't love the person next to you. First John, in the letter, he says that the one who says that I love God but does not love the person next to them is a liar. And these words are so close to what Martin Luther Jr. would say at one time that the church is a community of the beloved. That as we come together, we are in the place where love seeks to correct every injustice that occurs around us. You know, people of God, even as a people of Kenya today, I have been telling friends around, if things that are happening in our nation today do not break your heart, then you may need to ask whether you're a true Christian. If you are going into a supermarket today and you walk out, and as it's typical in most instances when you're walking out of the supermarket, there are some people that are out there 
that you find that, and you be, if you've not wondered, if you've always walked out of a supermarket and met those kids, that woman with a baby, you know, at times we do justify the, the, the scenery uh, or the scenario by saying these people have been planted here by certain people who are trying to meet money from me or from you. But I always say, yeah, even if they have been planted there for that reason, but still their state is pathetic. And draw some empathy, draw some attention from a true Christian. Indeed, Martin Luther King said that we are drawn by God to be a reflection of his limitless love. In a community or in a world or even in a country like ourselves that is polarized, fractured. Everywhere you go, you're either belonging to a camp. If you're not belonging to a camp, you don't, you, you, you're not valued in a sense. The parable of the Samaritan is Jesus' invitation to remind us of the essence of being a Christian. That's why we, read, we sang the song 319. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. There is nothing, children of God. It's easy to be in the business of Christianity without becoming the real thing. And therefore, this morning, children of God, my desire is to invite us to encounter the four characters in the story that are, draw, are confronted with the responsibility of love. The four characters in the story that we have before us that are confronted with the responsibility to love. You know, we have become so familiar with the story of the Samaritan until we fail to see the scandal in it whereby the people who could have been expected to do the good failed to do the good and somebody who was an outliner, somebody who was an outcast in anyone's eyes becomes the hero of the story. In fact, in any reading of the Bible, the messages are always in the place of the scandal, the place which is surprising. And in this place we find a Samaritan. The Bible is telling us that the Samaritan receives the accolades of Jesus. But we are so familiar with the story and sometimes ignore the message which is given to us. Let's look at the characters of the story and see how being confronted with the responsibility to love, how they respond to it. Please be into your story because you're just going to be there for the next few minutes. Verse 25 as we looked at it again of Luke chapter 10. The Bible says that, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The first person we meet in the story is a lawyer. As I was coming in, I met my friend Ted. And if you're in Ted, this could be just one of your colleagues, man. And I would imagine that the lawyer stands up to Jesus, engages Jesus in a dialogue. And I guess this was all that lawyers do. Lawyers like to get into certain, you know, debates and certain discussions just to prove the point. And this was just what the lawyer wanted to prove with Jesus. The Bible says he engaged Jesus to test him, probably of how much he understood. Now, this was not a constitutional lawyer. This was a scribe in the times of Jesus. He was a man well informed in the law and in the Torah of the Jew. He gets to Jesus. The Bible tells us and draws Jesus into a conversation. In fact, for the sake of remembering what you're going to study today, the whole, the, the, the verses from verse 25 all through to verse 37 uh, is divided into two and you'd find it divided into the conversation of the lawyer with Jesus. And the two questions that the lawyer asks Jesus. In the first instance, verse 25 to 28, the lawyer asks Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And from verse 30, going further from verse 29, he says, who is my neighbor? And that will form our message this morning, looking at the lawyer's conversation with Jesus. But let's look at the lawyer and see how the lawyer is confronted with the responsibility to love. Or for the sake of our message today, how is this lawyer confronted 
with the responsibility of community service. How is he confronted? Now look at the conversation after he poses the question to Jesus. Verse 25. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? The specialist of the law, both the written and the Torah, the lawyer asked the question. The motive is well spelled out that he wanted to tempt Jesus with a question. Now Jesus being also a rabbi or a rabbi per excellence, Verse 26 tells us of how he responds to the lawyer. A question with a question. What a cross-examination. You know, a question to a question. Verse 26, he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readeth thou? You know, Jesus understood that the man had tempted him or was testing him, and therefore he pits him where he belongs. He knew that a lawyer plays well in the place of questions in debates so he says okay tell me what is written in the law by the way what is written in the law can you tell me or how do you read the law you know the lawyer seeks to test jesus i want us to pause a little bit and reflect because jesus sets out a question that we need to answer also this morning Jesus sets the foundation of, uh, that, 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 that uh, would um, motivate every action of any man. Of how do you read the Bible? If I am going to be uh, an authentic community servant, meaning if my service to the community is going to be a lasting one, it's not going to be based on emotions. It's not going to be based on a single sermon on a Sabbath like today. If I am going to be one who will be found faithful to God's call to serve the community, I want to believe it will be uh, based or built on how I read the Bible. Jesus is asking the lawyer and I believe asking you today, how do you read? The Bible. You know, people of God, some of us read the Bible for reputation. The lawyer here could have been of that kind. You know, the rabbis, they read just to be known that they have read the Bible. Sometimes, even as a Bible teacher, I pause and ask myself, because I spend like all my days reading the Bible, but some, I pause and ask, but how am I reading the Bible? And that's the reason why nearly every year I want to read another Bible. I have quite a number of them and I want to read another one. Because I realize that if I read one that I've been reading all the time, it seems like it's premeditated. It's like determined what I'm going to read. It's like I know what's coming in the next text. But sometimes I pick up a strange version of the Bible and interestingly I get surprised. It's like I've never heard that place. How do you read the Bible? How do you read the Bible? Before you begin any action for the sake of God, you want to ask yourself, how do you read the Bible? I've said some of us read it for the sake of reputation. Some of us want to show how, 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 how we have sharp minds regarding the word of God. Some of us read it for the sake to critique it. By the way, for any Bible student who could be around, it has been said that all the heresies that have come out in the church, have come out of seminaries, have come out of places where people are training to study the word of God. Because why? How do they read the word of God? How do you read the word of God? This morning, just before we think about our title, Compassionate uh, Connections, I want you to first think of how have I been reading the Bible. Some of us also read the Bible just to affirm premeditated creeds of our church. As a people, I say this with a burden in my heart, as a people we are renowned to be the people of the Bible, the people of the book. We truly read the word of God, but how do we read it? How do you read the spirit of prophecy? We read it for the sake to be known that we are readers. 
And at times, because we can't get excited by anything, we start looking into different elements of teachings that could excite someone or could show just our prowess of the reading of the word of God. How do you read the word of God? In a sense, Jesus is not asking in any manner whether you read it with accuracy or you read it in the sense to be able to affirm certain doctrine. Jesus is saying, do you read to learn so that you can do? Do you read to learn? Then that way, do you read in delight of what God is saying? Jesus says in another place in John chapter 7, 17, that it's only when you do that you know. Only when you do that you know. Unfortunately, at times we want to know in, so that we do, but Jesus says it's only when you do that you know. So the man in which Jesus desires us to read the word is when we read to do. Many of us have been in the church for a while, but still find ourselves to be like toddlers, like children in the things of God. And you wonder why? Because it's how do you read the word of God? You read it at times just to be like, we have been around. We know what is in the Bible. You know, children of God, the times you are reading, we, we, are, staying, we, are, uh, we are living in are are times that I am asking myself this morning I have a friend by the way that's the reason why my wife is not with me this morning because we had guests from Zimbabwe uh, to attend Maxwell graduation so my wife had to stay back but as he was preaching at Maxwell and in the morning I just pulled out one of the gadgets uh, uh, GPT I guess many of the young people on chat GPT and I told him Oh, okay, look at what your sermon is all about. Meaning you can get into chat GPT and pull out a sermon. And it was like, wow. As teachers today, our teaching is becoming more, more, more difficult because a student can just pull out a thesis from chat GP, GPT. In the same manner, I'm also wondering as a people of God, when chat GPT can pull out a sermon for you and give it to you, how do you still read the Bible? Will it only be rhetorics? Will it only be information, conveying con information? Jesus is saying, read and learn and do. Then in that sense, while the world is progressing and advancing in all this way to make it relevant to the word of God, I guess our lives will grant the word of God authenticity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So how readeth thou, Jesus asked the lawyer. But remember, we are still trying to ask the question, how is the lawyer re, uh, responding? The lawyer is astute. He understands the law. He, he, re, he responds, actually, he gives the thesis. He gives the conclusion of the whole law. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. He knows he memorized it. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and with all your, you, uh, with, with all your strength and you love your neighbor as yourself. He pulls it out, tells it to Jesus. In fact, the Bible says Jesus acknowledged that he was right. He was right. The lawyer has sufficient knowledge of the scripture. He's able to give the whole law just in a, in a sentence. The lawyer had adequate understanding. But child of God, how readeth thou the Bible? He understood that indeed God expects us to love him. To love him emotionally. He wants you to feel, to have affection for him. Love him with, your own, with all your heart. He does not only want you to love him affect with, with, with your emotions but he also wants you to love him with your will meaning you have to make certain decisions love him with all your soul the lawyer understands it's not only the emotions and the will but you also have to love him physically you have to come to church in a way that I would illustrate that show your effort strive Jesus says or Paul tells us that we have to work out our salvation, meaning physical. Yes, we are saved by grace, but that grace must be established by works, physically. You can't say it's grace alone and sit back. You can't give an offering, 
the lawyer says, love him with all your strength. Strive. And not only that, that your feelings, you, 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 your will and your, your strength, but he says also intellectually. Yeah, especially in the days of Shakahola, like today, you have to love him inter intellectually. People of God, we're not going to be caught in these emotional vibes that are there today. We need to understand. Jesus says, love the Lord with your mind. Be well informed. Peter says, for everything you believe, have a reason for it. Please, I pray. I thank God for my church because I don't believe things because pastors have said. I believe things because I have I've, I've, I've received a teaching and an understanding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I have neighbors around me. Sometimes I've met and people say they do it because pastor Amesema, Apana. The lawyer says, love the Lord your God with all your mind. I want to say one thing about the lawyer. As he encounters the question of love. Now take the note of this. The lawyer thought that loving God or loving your neighbor, because that's our concern this morning, is about studying. The lawyer thought that the neighbor is supposed to be probably like a, a text to study. Just like many of us. Would imagine that love is all about studying to understand what is love and therefore he fails at that way to connect let's look at the second person let's, let's look at the second person who is truly the neighbor now the lawyer the bible says in verse 29 that in seeking to justify himself because jesus told him you have answered rightly go and do it you know, people of God, many people would say that it's all about grace, just believe. But Jesus says, go and do it. Meaning, it is grace that works. It is the law and grace. It's not only grace. Grace says, live by trusting Jesus and do what Jesus wants you to do. Hallelujah. So the lawyer is told by Jesus, go and do it. And at this junction, the Bible tells us that the lawyer tried to test Jesus and now ushers us into the other three characters. So for the lawyer, love is a text to study. And that could be many of us also. We could fail onto our call to serve the community because all this while, we are just studying what it is to love. What it is to love. It's all about head. It's all about the head. And therefore the lawyer seeking to justify himself. Asks the second question. That takes us into the second segment of this chapter. And also introduces us to the other three characters. Confronted with this question of love. So the lawyer asked Jesus who is my neighbor. And the Bible tells us the motive seeking to justify himself. Now within the Jewish context the lawyer understood that the love they had would to be only to the Jew. So who is my neighbor? He could have understood. By the way, it was difficult. A lawyer who had already said that love your neighbor does not understand who my neighbor is. You can see the contradiction in the answer. Also showing that knowledge anyway does not determine wisdom. That you could have all the knowledge about the word of God but fail to know how to apply that word of God. The lawyer introduces us to the story. Jesus understands that they could go into this dialogue back and forth, asking a question, answering question, and Jesus, is in his typical way, gets into a story. He begins to tell a story. He talks of a story. Jesus draws blood and murder. You know, sometimes, people of God, we're talking about community service. And sometimes it has no impact as long as it's about understanding the text. And Jesus, I would imagine, desiring to make an impact on this man, brings in a story of blood and murder. Who will not pay attention to a story of death? 
When you hear anyone speaking about somebody killing another one, who will not want to pay attention to that? Anybody speaking about death will definitely draw attention. Jesus brings out a story of blood and murder. He tells of a story that brings out the three characters. The first character is the, uh, are the robbers. Are the robbers. The thieves. Jesus speaks about the thieves. The second we have the character of religious people. Religious people. He speaks of the Levite and the priest. And finally, Jesus speaks about the righteous Samaritan. As we shall see at the end of the story, Jesus asks, of the three, who would, was a neighbor? I want to begin by looking at the robbers confronted by the question of a neighbor. Who is my neighbor? The robbers are said to have been in the route from Jerusalem going down to Jericho. We know the story. That's why I'm just bringing out the bits of it. Jerusalem was in a high place and Jericho was in a down place as it could be described. The estimates of the distances could be given about 5,000 feet above sea level. And the Bible tells us that Jericho, between Jerusalem and Jericho, they were robbers. That was their place. Hallelujah, children of God. Praise God. I know it's cold, but please ensure me that I am with you still because this is where maybe our message is. Remember, the title of our message is Compassionate Connections. So the robbers are presented to us. The robbers characterize any one of us. The Bible says that there were robbers in between. Their depiction here is given to us that they come to a certain man who is a traveler, a man whose name is not given. But the robbers are depicted as such. They come, they take the clothes, or they strip the man naked. They take the clothes, they take everything that is valuable, they wound the man, and then they depart, leaving the man half dead. That's how the story depicts the robbers. Josephus, one of the church historians, tells us that at the particular time when Jesus was telling the story, that there were about 40,000 workers that had been, had been uh, dismissed from the temple work. So they had gone in between the caves on that route, and that was their work, just to wait for any vulnerable person to rob them. So here are the robbers, people of God. What would you think of them in a story regarding loving your neighbor or who is my neighbor? What kind of an image would you imagine Jesus painting in your mind of robbers? You know, what could you think about them? You know, reading in context, what would you think of them in a question that is posed, who is your neighbor? Who are robbers? How are robbers depicting or answering the question, who is my neighbor? Now, let me suggest something to you here. The robbers here would be saying this. Please take this down if you're interested, but it trusts me so much that the robbers would be having attitude like this. What is yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. In a place where God is inviting his children to serve their communities, the robbers have the attitude of, what is yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. In another way, they are saying, you are a nobody, and all that is rightful for you is to be slaughtered. Now, the young kid that gave us the children's story had a statement in the story. As much as I said, it was such an exalted story. But the young kid said something. We are in a society of a man-eat-man society. We are in a society where it is your world and God for us all. Find it for yourself. In such a society and with a call for the community service, you want to think yourself of this attitude of the robber. Children of God as Kenyans today, thinking of the new finance bills, thinking of the government of the day, and thinking of all that is going on today, you want to think of an attitude of the robber. What you have is mine, and I'm coming for it. 
It's so unfortunate, children of God, that even in the days of the Bible, when the plagues and the judgment of God came to a nation, they came when men went after the things of those who are less fortunate. You know, I was in India, and I remember one thing, that when, in, when, when we were in India, um, for all the three years I was in India, I can't remember when bread, sugar, and milk ever had an increase. In Indian economy, and this is a nation that does not pride itself as a Christian nation, but in the Indian economy, I see a people who are quite concerned of the less fortunate in the society. So things like bread, the Indians will not hike. Things like sugar, the Indians will not hike. What I'm saying, the robbers give us a picture of a society where people say, what you have is mine. And I'm coming for it. When we are calling each other to take concern of our community, could this be an attitude that is being demonstrated in the midst of God's children? It could not be that we are going out there to wound somebody. We are going out there to kill somebody. But when we see tribalism, nepotism, when you see uh, all these ills in the society, if we as Christians cannot stand and speak against them, as Jesus or the spirit of prophecy speaks regarding John the Baptist on the day that he was beheaded, Sister White makes a statement and says there were many prophets around at that time when John stood up to speak against Herod, and they didn't speak, and God held them accountable for the acts of the king. And I get convicted as a Christian. And I may say I'm not a robber. I'm not going to take anything from anyone. But if I don't speak about injustices regarding the neighbor, people who don't value the less fortunate, then I am just also with an attitude of the robber. Children of God, I want to believe that one way God is calling us as a people that we may be able to take care of our communities also to speak against injustices. It's also to rise up in moments when we feel that there is injustice towards the less fortunate. It's easy to come to church and sit and listen to a good sermon or even a worse sermon and go home as a Christian. But is that all God is calling us for children of God? I don't believe so. God is calling us to feel a bit uncomfortable, to be inconvenient. And that brings us to the next group in the story, the Levite and the priest. While the robbers say, what is yours is mine, I'm coming for it. And while the robbers say that the, 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 the traveler is a nobody, all that he deserves is to be slaughtered. Children of God, the priests are told, we are told that by chance... I don't want to engage that a lot, but he tells us of how Jesus draws in the scribes and says, by chance, coincidentally, the priest passed by. Then the Levite, the religious leaders. You know, the religious leaders who lived in Jericho had to go to Jerusalem to serve their lot, and they had to go there for two weeks to serve. And therefore, it was typical to be found on that road as they traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us these religious leaders, the priests, listen to how the narration goes. It says, the priest came alongside. Then he stepped aside. You know what I see of them, which is myself, and I sometimes feel like it. As a religious person, sometimes it's like, this is a nuisance. Shun it. This is inconveniencing. Shun it. I'm running to church. Shun it. As priests, they felt they needed not to be contaminated because if that was a dead person, it means they will not have the opportunity to serve. So for the sake of the rituals of the church, they shunned the suffering of a man. Is it not true sometimes that we, I can be rushing to church and overlook a suffering of a neighbor. I'd rather be in church than to attend to a neighbor who needs me. Hallelujah, children of God. Hallelujah. 
Oh my goodness, that is me. I don't know about you. But I found sometimes when, when people, and it's interesting that it's always on Sabbath, driving just at the roundabout at Daystar, coming to church to preach a sermon. And the lights are not going on, green light is not coming, it's a traffic. And there are these people coming by. I want to put my window up so that they don't inconvenience me. They should be shunned. I'm rushing to preach. Somebody's with me. The priest and the Levite so stood aside. Child of God, the Bible says of these priests and the Levite, they had an opportunity. They had the knowledge of what God expects with, of them, but they failed to apply the knowledge. And I want to say this. Religious work does not make the worker religious. Just because you're engaged in a religious work, it doesn't make you religious. These are good people. These are religious people. These are servants of God. But they failed to seize the opportunity. Listen to this that somebody wrote somewhere. A poem that somebody wrote said, I was hungry and you formed a humanity club for me to discuss my hunger. Thank you. I was in prison and you crept off quietly to your chapel to pray for me, my release. Thank you. And that is nice. I was naked and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. What good did that do? I was sick and you knelt and thanked God for your health. But I needed you. I was homeless and you preached to me the shelter of the love of God. I wish you had taken me in your home. I was lonely and you left me alone to pray for me. Why didn't you stay alone with me? You seem so holy, so close to God, but I'm still hungry, I'm still lonely, I'm still cold and still in pain. Does it matter to anyone? Anonymous, children of God, the robber says, what you have is mine. I'm coming for it. The religious leaders say, what is mine? I'm going to keep it. I'm going to safeguard it. I'm not going to allow inconveniencing. I'll shun anything that wants to inconvenience and make me uncomfortable. That's what the religious character here tends to depict. The religion or the religious work sometimes overshadows the religious life. I could be so busy with my religion serving my church and fail to show the authenticity of my religion. Children of God, let me not get into that, but the neighbor to the religious person was an inconvenience that should be shunned. Let me finish up this message today by drawing in the hero of the story. The hero of the story is a righteous man. In fact, I'm not drawing it out. The Bible itself tells us that this was a righteous man. In verse 33, the Bible says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. At the end of it, Jesus asks the scribe, and who of these three was a neighbor? One who loved the neighbor as he loved himself. So that's the manner why we are saying this was a righteous man. In verse 33, it says that he had compassion. Compassionate connection. This righteous man had compassion, child of God. That's the title of my message. Compassionate connection. The word compassion is in, interesting here. In its original, it carries the force that says that he had his inwards turning upside down. Meaning the organs, the heart, the lungs, the liver. My elder Oyo would confirm some of these things, whether they really happen. But the intestines were going round. Meaning when he saw the man, those organs within him started rotating. You know, it felt like puking. He became uncomfortable, compassion. 
Compassion is not sympathy. Compassion means you, 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 you are totally disoriented. You are uneasy. When I am at the, the lights and this child comes out at my, my window and, you know, I get uncomfortable. I, I can't feel like I have to drive away. And I even don't want to, to think of the 20 shillings only that I have there. I know that that cannot buy even a piece of bread. I have to be, I have to be inconvenienced. If I know that I'm going to take a meal somewhere, I have to be inconvenienced. That meal, if I was going to take a meal with the Jews, then I have to be inconvenienced just to go and eat bread. So that this guy, if God has led them to my window, and I know that I have something somewhere, child of God, I'm being inconvenienced. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the man had compassion. He was, he was inconvenienced. He, he felt his lungs as though they were coming to his mouth. Compassion connection. And I want to say, children of God, that the essence of compassion is the response to human suffering. That is where we could talk of community service. Please don't go out there for the sake of the program. God have mercy. Don't go because there's a program. We have to do. pray God. You know, uh, one month ago we were in Mumias with a friend who came from the States and we were in Mumias in some of the Sunday churches preaching and we had to go in a school and out of one class of 40 students, 33 of them had jiggers. Talk of compassion. Then that day I felt compassion. Except for a jigger that I remember having one time in the village. I have never seen something like that again. So the kids, 37, 33 of them had jiggers. Child of God, 33. Now the brother that was many, we were ministering with had come uh, with some resources for medication. And, but there were ladies who were experts with the jiggers. They were not doctors. They were not nursing. But I remember at one time, a kid, I think that was a standard two kid, as the ladies were removing the jiggers, those who have stayed around on earth for a long time, you understand what I say. Jiggers, you don't just enter. You enter with skill. So as the lady was trying to call her, <laughs> in my language you'd say that, as the lady was trying to bring out the jigger, I remember my heart skipping a little bit. And I had to remind myself, this is where God wants me to be. And I remember just saying, God have mercy on me. I can see that this is above me with all the degrees, with all my accolades. This is above me. Help me, Lord. Child of God, community service needs compassion. We need to be compassionate. The, the Samaritan went there, bounded the wounds, and the Bible tells us he took care of the neighbor and he went. What motivated him? Compassion. That deep feeling within. Love for the Samaritan was service. To the scribe, the neighbor is a study. To the robber, the neighbor is nobody. Slay him. To the priests, the neighbor is an inconvenience or a nuisance. Shun. But to the Samaritan, a neighbor is for service. Hallelujah. The neighbor is for service. Children of God, the neighbor must be understood as one who stands next to us. Whatever tribe, whatever social status, whatever economical status, no barriers in a society that is polarized, a neighbor is one that stands beside us. When the robber says, what is yours is mine, I'm coming for it. And when the priest and the Levite say, what is mine is mine and I keep it, the Samaritan says, what is mine? is yours and I'll share it with you with the compassion he says what is mine in is yours and I want to share it with you children of God the Samaritan teaches us how to love as we conclude this message let me just say how do we love how do we love or how do we go there that we may love if you want to love your neighbor then your love is displayed with compassion as you have already said, 
in many instances when Jesus, the Bible tells us, had compassion, he had compassion to the hungry, he had compassion to the sick, he had compassion to the physically disposed. He was heartbroken. The, 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 uh, the pioneers or the founders of World Mission have a statement that captures my mind. That is, they say, anything that breaks the heart of God should break your heart. Love is displayed with compassion. If you love somebody, you truly have to feel and have that compassion. Love, in the Samaritan's case, is demonstrated with contact. Children of God, the Samaritan reached down, touched the man, bounded the man, because love has to take a risk. If you love anybody and you can't take a risk, that's not love. The Levite and the priest feared to take risk. They couldn't love. They couldn't show compassion. They couldn't serve this traveler. So love is to be displayed by compassion. Love, you must get in contact with. You can't say somebody that you love if you're not in contact. But there's also another thing that we see in the story here that love is delivered with care. The Samaritan showed mercy. He went there, touched him, wounded him, and he went further even to pay or to, to, um, to oil him so that he could heal. And finally, in the Samaritan story, love is costly. Love is costly. Love without price is not love. The Samaritan man saw the man went there. He risked himself. Who knows? It could have been a setup. That was the cost. He had the heart of compassion. But not only that, he decided to, to walk as he placed the man on his beast, the donkey, while he walked. The cost was there. He walked while he carried the man on his beast. The man had to be... And finally, the Bible tells us he paid for the bills. In fact, the way the narration goes, is like he even gave his ATM card. He's saying, when you are done and realizes that what has paid is falling short, please use my ATM card. He even gave the number, if it was today. He said, you can patch in these numbers and get your, your extra. Love is costly. You can't say that you love if you're not going to spend. We have to sacrifice in order to show that we truly love. Children of God, as we leave this place today, we want to remember that the secret of love is not found in your religion, is not found in your church, in our church. We want to remember that the scribe and the religious priest were all religious people, but they didn't love. It doesn't mean that because you belong to the church, automatically love. You know, that's why even in marriage, we keep telling each other, just because we are married, it doesn't mean that love will just blossom. We have to work on our love together, honey. Love is not, is not dictated because of our churchy. But there's something else that I also appreciated hearing it also being said. That the secret of loving is not found in responsibility. Yes, the scribe, the religious man knew the responsibility to love. Just like as we are in church today, we know the responsibility to love. But they still didn't love. So it means love is not dictated because you have a responsibility upon you. People do not love because they are to love. There are many men in the congregation today who know they ought to love their wives, but they don't love them. Even though they have been taught, love your wife, they don't love them. Love is not a responsibility. Love is not a religion. It's not found in your religion, but here it is. Love is found in a relationship. Love is found in a relationship. And there is no better place where we can see this depicted than in the life of Jesus. That is only in Jesus Christ. Time fails me. I would have gone for us to read a depiction of God's, uh, of God's image of love in Ezekiel 16. But the story of the Good Samaritan shows us the relationship that God has shown us in Jesus Christ. And it's all as the Bible tells us that in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus, Philippians chapter 2 says, he did not hold on to being God. He came down. 
Just like the man, the traveler coming all the way. He came down because of you and me. He sick you and me. Jesus saw our brokenness, our wounded state, our burdenness, and the sin that separates us from God. And despite his divine status, Jesus humbled himself, descended from heaven to earth in order that love may lift us up. A relationship he sought to form with us. Ultimately, God is our greatest good Samaritan. Jesus is the one who shows compassion in every instance he feels for us. Jesus says the kingdom of God belongs to me, but it also belongs to you if you can believe in me. You and me, child of God, are being challenged. If you have experienced the love of Jesus, the Bible says we love because we have been loved. We cannot in any way fail to love if we have truly experienced the love of Jesus. You and me are to ask yourself as you leave this morning, are you the robber who will look at people as opportunities to slaughter, value them of what they have only? Are you the religious person who will be so concerned with what is yours that you need to keep to yourself? Jesus invites us all to be the Samaritan, to be the outliers, those who are not part of what could be expected, who will stand out and say, what is mine is yours, and I'll share it with you in Jesus' name. Amen.